Yeah. So for today, I'll I'll talk about two point eight and two point nine. Two point ten is just the sort of like what what to do. What sort of like what are the next steps? And there are some interesting references there that, uh, that I would I would also recommend for you to look into. So. Again, the learning objectives for sections 2.8 and 2.9 is to first to work out this uh, intuitive measure of stability called the condition number as applied to systems of linear equations. Uh, and, then ex and then to explore the effect of having additional structure on the implementation and computational time of uh, LU factorization. Um, so the, the first question is, why should we care about this condition number? Uh, Chapter one already has that discussion, but but I think for this section, um, something came up, or these there's something very specific in this section about it. Uh, so first, more gen at the more general level, it's a way to quantify the stability of outputs with respect to small changes in inputs, or what they would call perturbations. Uh, one of the results in section two point eight suggests that this condition number shows up in the upper bound okay and I think they they argue that it's uh, a sharp upper bound okay and then it's also a way for us to uh, diagnose whether your square matrix is effectively singular from a numerical point of view meaning that if this condition number was computed to be very large then chances are, your square matrix is uh, effectively singular from that uh, from a numerical perspective, although from an analytical perspective on pen and paper, it might look non-singular, but from a numerical point of view, it's effectively singular. Okay. And uh, we should care about it because it's a signal that we may have to think about things a bit more carefully in terms of the numerical in implementation, right? So one thing that is emphasized in the in the chapters in chapter one and two is that the transition from analytic to numerical uh, is not just direct uh, copy uh, of what you. It's not uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, kind of uh, approach so that's what uh, those are sort of like what i could think of are four reasons we should care about the condition number so the theory is that so the theory for the conditioning part is that there's this definition in section section 1.2 in section 1.2 i think and uh in the one-dimensional case uh, and section one focuses on the one-dimensional case, one-dimensional input, one-dimensional output. And uh, I'm trained as an economist, so I, 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 my interpretation of the condition number is that it's an elasticity. So it's a, it's a person how a percentage change uh, in inputs will will affect outputs on a relative on a relative scale. Okay. So again, the context is that we're solving a system of linear equations, uh, ax is equal to b, and then that sec the section about vector and matrix norms, with tons of these definitions, uh, plus this elasticity interpretation gives us the error bounds for the effects of perturbations of b or a on x. So when b is perturbed, a is held constant, and then see what happens to x, or you hold B constant and then perturb A accordingly and then see what happens to X. And the error bounds are found in the in the book. They the derivation there is not from first principles directly because you because the definition of the condition number is really for one dimensional cases. So if you really want to go through the the algebra uh, or at least the work, it's not very direct. So in fact, it starts from, from assuming that the condition condition number in the multidimensional case is also an elasticity and then works from there. Okay. So what's important to notice is that the left hand side here is um the left hand side here could be thought of as the relative error. Okay. And then the upper bound is you have the condition number times the relative change in uh in b okay similarly you have the relative the relative change in a here but of course these norms for matrix a has to be 
according to a particular norm uh, and it's in section 2.7, okay? So what you should notice from these bounds is that the upper bound depends only on a function of A, uh, not very exact, but the upper bound in the sense that these perturbations are something that you could design, okay? But the, the part here, kappa of A, kappa of A here, uh, effectively what's left is this kappa of A. And that's that's the function of A, that's the function of A that I'm talking about. So it'd be the condition number for A. And there's a derivation of what it would look like. And I'll talk about this in a, in a bit. So when you're solving, what, another thing to observe is that um, when solving a linear system, all all that can be expected is that the backward error, not the error, is small. We really do, the re, the main reason is that we do not get to see the exact solution x, and you can see it here right away. This thing at the at the top and the bottom are uh, how how should I put it? They are they're abstract, so they're fictional in the sense that we really don't know what x looks like, but we do know what's the we, we may not necessarily know the exact solution. Uh, so in that sense, we really don't know this quantity. That's why we had to calculate these upper bounds. Okay. Uh, and then hope for the best. Okay. And then one thing to also note is that one of the definitions in the book called the, the residual okay, and the backward error are the same for a linear system. I think this plays a role in the next few chapters. Okay, So this is something to note. And then this kappa A has a closed form and it kind of looks like this. And you see that the inverse shows up. The choice of the norm is here as well. And then effectively, you know that if this kappa, if this is not invertible, if A is not invertible, this, this part might, you will all definitely run into problems. And this goes to infinity if A is singular. And if you take the log of this condition number for base 10, it gives you a rough measure of how many dig digits of accuracy were lost. So that's sort of like the conditioning number, uh, condition number part, okay? The other part of the theory is the structured matrix uh, part of the theory, okay? So what happens if your matrix has uh, a special structure? Either you have zeros in strategic places or you have a particular pattern uh what will happen to uh the factorization and computational times so a nice example is the symmetric matrix case so if you say that a is symmetric that means that a transpose is equal to a but if you proceeded as if you, you just did lu fact or lu from the book uh the restrictions that are implied by this uh equation are not used so what this means is that the restriction that the ijth entry of A is the same as the jith entry of A transpose, uh, that's not imposed when you do LU factorization at all. So in order to preserve symmetry, you need to do something else. So one approach would be to say something like, okay, I'll... I'll start with L unit lower triangular, just like before. And then maybe LL transpose is a good idea because if you take the transpose, you will still get LL transpose again, okay? Uh, but the problem is that if you do this, there are not enough independent pieces of information to pin down the entries of L uniquely. Uh, what that means is that if you have a unit lower triangular matrix, you already know that the top part uh, are all zeros and then the the bottom part are, you, you, you need to figure out what's in the bottom part, except for the main diagonal, which you know to be all ones. So there are n times n minus one over two missing entries, but uh, that, that's the, those are the missing entries. And you also know that on the top part, they're all zeros. So in, in that sense, they're, and then in the A matrix, in the A matrix, you have n times n plus one over two entries that you have information about. 
okay because it's a symmetric matrix so you don't really need to know the other part the upper upper dia those things that are the upper drag uh above the diagonal or below the diagonal so in that sense there are you miss a few there are not a lot of uh information to pin down some of the entries and if you remove the unit requirement, that will also work, but it brings extra restrictions not implied by symmetry. In particular, the main diagonal entries are now restricted to be positive, okay? Where, where in fact, in for the symmetric case, there's no restriction on the main diag on the sign of the main diagonal entries. So in that sense, uh, they're they're not free to vary. So the that's why the book suggests LDL transpose instead. So this is how I. I made sense of what, uh, at least intuitively, what, what it would look like. And then if you have a symmetric positive definite matrix, then you could go through the same kind of argument, use LDL transpose. And then if you want to impose the positive definiteness, then you would have, you would come to the conclusion that the D has to have positive main diagonal entries. And then from there you get the, uh, either the the Cholesky a Cholesky factorization, okay, as a result, and then there are computing times that were also calculated. So wait a minute. So why does that mean that we can just set D to be the identity matrix? Though, sorry. So in the Cholesky factorization, D just becomes identity, right? No, it it doesn't have to be an identity matrix at all. Oh, okay. I thought it was. I thought it was just LL. Transpose so earlier it was LL transpose because I, I wanted to show you that uh, it should be LDL transpose because it's sort of like sudden, right? Like when you read the chapter, it's like, okay, we start with LU and then suddenly they say LDL transpose. Sorry? I didn't say anything. Yeah, no. but the Cholesky is different. Yeah. It's not really related to. I agree with you, Ron. It, it's not, those are two different decompositions. Okay. Yes, 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 that's right. So earlier it was um, uh, just for symmetric matrices. And then this one is for, if you want symmetric and positive definite, then you need to do something more. You have to restrict the D in a, in a particular way. Uh, that's at least my understanding of it, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, is it okay? Very good. Uh, so, so the comp computational times are listed down here. Uh, I didn't go through all of the mate, the struct, the types of structured matrices in the, in section 2.9, they talk about tri, di tri diagonal matrices, which is you have a main diagonal and then one above and one below have potentially non-zero entries and the, the rest are zero entries. Mm -hmm. And there's a big reduction in the computational time as a result for doing LU factorization. And then LU factorization typically do, uses two N cube over three flops, uh, but the factorization for symmetric matrices, you lessen the time, uh, you, this factor two uh, becomes one. Similarly, you see something for Cholesky factorization. So if effectively, the last three tell you that there shouldn't be a slope change when you do a log-log plot, only a parallel shift. So there are gains. There are, there are definitely computational gains, but it didn't make the slope uh, of, the, of the line on a log-log plot. Um, uh, how should I put it? Uh, it didn't make it uh, flatter, okay? So there, there are special matrix structures that were spread around in chapter two, and there are the numerically nice ones. There are the sparse ones, which is you have zeros on strategic places, and then you have the deadlier ones, which, which are the Hilbert matrix, which is one, one of the demo matrices. And then the Vandermond uh, matrix, which you've encountered in the polynomial interp interpolation uh, uh, section, uh, they don't talk about this directly. But I, I did some, I did a bit of a uh, uh, binging, and then uh, it, uh, 
there were there were recent there's still recent papers talking about its uh ill conditioning so yeah so that so yeah <laughs> so again this is the what you need for julia call and then there are new commands for julia uh for gener i i put it i, I put them all down here uh, as a reference and there are sort of like specific to fnc okay sp diag m and then cholesky okay and just and to then, be clear, that FNC Cholesky is just the linear. It's just the linear algebra library. Just he's oh, re, re-exported it. Yeah, oh. he re-exports all these things in the FNC. That's oh. one of the things I was going to try. He in the on his website, he says you can do a you can do a, a fast loading version of FNC that doesn't include as many libraries, and then you have to include them yourself, but oh. or use them okay. yourself. Okay, I'll fix so this one. Thing. So, well, it does work this way, but it's from that you can get it through the linear algebra as well. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was surprised by it as well. I was like, oh, okay, it's it's there. Okay, it's on. I thought it was only there. Okay, so or in some other package, but uh, yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, and then there, there, the only really new things here is sort of like calculating these condition numbers. So if you, uh, this is an exercise that we've the, that I've done before. And uh, the idea is just to to just calculate this condition num conditioning number and cond from FNC also does this uh, for you, uh, and you will see the conditioning number exploding to to this point. Okay, uh, one thing about the book that might not be very obvious, and I think my eyes were deceiving me at some point, is that sometimes when you read this, you might think that this is one point four only and not notice this e part. So that uh, that yeah <laughs> yeah after a while it gets to you so yeah uh and then there's another exercise about again this is an example that uh, Torin showed last time uh to show that even if a is well condi uh, well conditioned the LU factorization uh is gonna be ill conditioned is gonna be unstable. And there's an analytical solution, but the numerical solution is off is awful. So you see conditioning numbers reaching to this to this scale. Okay. Yeah, but there's really nothing new here except using the same code. The only thing that is really new here is this part. Okay, that dot there, because you'll be dealing with decimals. So this is something that uh, should be noted. And then the another thing that I also wanted to share is one of the demos uh, in two in, in section two point eight. Uh, it says that something like um, the relative error is two point three, and then there's as anticipated the the solution has zero accurate digits in the two norm. It feels that they are incompatible statements, and um, when I looked at the the calculate the pasted uh relative error in in their text it's act it's it doesn't reproduce correctly so that's what i wanted to share so it's the code is here you could also try it for yourself it's a hilbert matrix and it's shown here basically what what you see in a hilbert matrix is that the the topmost part is sort of like the largest and then it as you go further down uh the matrix you get smaller and smaller entries nearing zero so the relative error that i got is 16.9 and this is not a, a random matrix so this is something that i wanted to share and then there's another exercise yeah, I, sorry Torin. yeah i i did the same thing yeah so i i had yeah. the same number yeah 16. yeah and then the exercise about verifying the error bound is roughly similar as before, but they introduce a new command called matrix depot, I guess. Uh, uh, I don't know what this is, but it just showed up. And then I just demonstrate, I, I just put up what these matrices could look like. I don't think these are random matrices. These are sort of like uh, a collection. I, I have a feeling that this is a collection of matrices that are the nice ones and the not so nice ones. 
Um, and then I have, uh, it's, if you look at the code, it almost looks exactly the same with a couple of changes here and there, okay? Meant to sort of like demonstrate this inequality. And then there's another exercise about uh, showing the benefits of having sparse matrices and uh, asking you to explore uh, the commands try U and then try L and then try diagonal, okay? Um, the point is that the try diagonal command is sort of like specialized, sort of like incorporate. I don't know how they modified it, but they incorporated specific changes to it so that it runs a bit uh, faster compared to try U and try L. And the idea is to exploit the sparsity stuff, okay? Sparse matrix, uh, sparse matrices, okay? And essentially the idea is to have systems of equations where the A matrix is generated this way. And then the alternative is that the A matrix is generated that way using tri-diagonal. Uh, it would have been nice, I think, at least I, I followed the instructions for this one. It would have been nice to hold constant the random numbers that were used so that from A to Alt A, okay? Rather than, so I'm not saying about setting the seed. I'm saying that the A and Alt A uh, could have used the same sort of like random numbers uh, so that that could be sort of like suppressed in or at least controlled for in this experiment. But I don't think yeah. it's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think you could have done that by just having another line above that it just saves that as the inner make, you know, the, the source matrix or source equals rand n n. That would make create the, the matrix one by one. Then you can convert it to the uh, tri diagonal. That's right. That's right. So that, that should make things work uh, a bit better. You know? uh, thanks for that. I, I should put that there. But again, this is something similar to what you've seen before. Uh, it's not going to be, sir. It's not. Uh, let me just show you the final result because I don't have a lot of time anymore. The final result is that you have, uh, if you use the try U, try L thing, the computational times are O N cube. Okay. And then if you use tri diagonal, it's linear, which is what you would expect for the banded matrix, uh, for the tri diagonal matrix case. Okay, it's really a banded matrix where the bandwidths are set to one. Okay, uh, you would notice this outlier, seemingly an outlier here, but this is the throwaway to force compilation uh, part, and I I put it here for just so just for effect. Uh, so. It does import. It is important for comparing these compilation times, uh, and the the last point is that it's not enough to know that there's sparsity. You do have to modify the algorithm to exploit the sparsity. Uh, the book only has one situation where you're asked to actually do it yourself, and it's uh, exercise two point nine point four. I I didn't have time to work on that, so I I, I left it for there for the moment there that's it for now <laughs> done done for chapter two we can now move on. <laughs> if you have questions uh remarks or comments about the this part do let me know i think it was very good very thorough yeah let me stop sharing no thanks i certainly didn't have as much time to do very many exercises i only looked at two different exercises for this next section or the first two parts uh 3.1 and 3.2 so i'll try to get through um both of those sections but if i only get through one or section i think i can still finish it up in the next week it's not very long at least i hope not assuming i don't talk too slow my usual problem is to talk too fast so that should be a problem <laughs> Uh, let's see. <clears throat> there we go. So these are the notes um, for chapter three. This chapter is about looking at the um, uh, overdetermined linear system. So 
uh, in the last chapter, we looked at these things, systems like AX equals B where A was square, but now we want to consider cases where A is rectangular, in particular when M, if A is M by N matrix, M is greater than N, as it's longer, taller than it is wide, right? Um, so that's the first half of the chapter. The second half of the chapter is learning to do that more efficiently using QR uh, factorization. So that's 3.3 and 3.4, I think. Let me just check. Yes. Uh, so for this first part, he starts out with an example of anomaly temperatures versus year. Um, and the only tool we have so far in the book anyway, is to try to do a polynomial fit to that uh, with the square matrix, that is the interpolant for this, right? And if you do that um, using the, the methods we've learned before, just using the backslash operator, uh, we just define that, van, what do you call it? Vandermond matrix, I always forget that. Yeah, Vandermond. Vandermond yeah. matrix for it, um, constructed in the usual way. Um, and you calculate the coefficients and you can plot the polynomial and it looks all crazy, all squiggly because it has to, it's being forced to go through every single point. And we know this where all data scientists we understand this is just being uh, overfitting or trying to fit to the noise by using such a high order polynomial. So the idea is to use a lower degree polynomial where, um, in which we can, this is how the equation looks, but we can re-express that in, in a matrix form. And it looks like the Vandermond matrix, but now it's taller than it is wider. Um, so I would see this overdetermined system, so we can't solve it exactly. There's no coefficients that we could use to solve this exactly, except in certain weird singular cases. But um, generally, there's, you cannot solve it exactly. So um, an example is all these lines are exactly in a straight line. We could fit it to an exact straight line. But that'd be a, a strange case, right? Uh, so. It turns out that Julia can solve this approximately with the same backslash operator we've already been using. So we can actually just put this in, um, just doing a linear fit here. So my vendor mod matrix is just ones and then T. Uh, so just take uh, B and backslash it with temp. Uh, temp it was the, um, why did I call it temp? It's temperature. The temperature. The temperature. Oh, temperature. I like to think it's temporary. What? <laughs> Why are we got a temporary variable? <laughs> Confuse me. I haven't looked at this for a few days. So in any event, we can just use a backslash operator. It does some magic, and it will find a, a, a good line to go through there. Um, and that, that's basically the introduction to that section. So what's a good line? Um, well, uh, this is what's called a least squares fit. So the problem is formulated in this way. We have some. Uh, Function some more and more. This is more general than we did before. Now, instead of just having one a t t squared t q, we can have any functions, any fixed functions of t, and then we have coefficients in front of them that are linearly multiplying these functions. And we want to make as good a fit as we can to f of t using this, these sometimes called basis functions. And we know the fit will only be approximate, so there's some residuals. We learned that term last time. Uh, y sub i minus f, and we want to make those small in, in some sense. And the usual sense that is used is this least squared sense. And that we want to look for um, coefficients such that this sum of residuals squared is as small as it can be, minimal. And that's not the only choice you can make. That's just the common choice. I guess it can be justified a couple of different ways. The chapter mentions um, something about energy. But also, it's the um, if you have Gaussian errors, this is the maximum likelihood estimate of the coefficients. Um, but I guess the most important reason is that it's much easier to solve <laughs> than some other functions you might think about, some other norms you might think about using here. Again, we can write this as a matrix problem um, where the residuals are equal to this output and this, this kind of Vandermont form type of matrix sort of um, times our coefficients or written like this, B minus AX. So this is the same kind of thing we've seen before, but now um, we can't solve for zero, we can solve for some minimal R. So the least squares problem is then to minimize R transpose R, which is the same thing as what's being expressed up here in this equation. I guess that's another nice thing about it, is uh, the least squares is, can be expressed as an inner product, which is what makes the algebra easier. So all that wraps up into this definition that he gives. This is the definition of the least, squares pro least squared problem. 
forget about all this. It's basically a matrix problem. We've got some matrix that's rectangular and tall. We've got some um, uh, vector B, and then we've got, we want to find uh, X that can minimize this equation here, this norm, this two norm. That's the least squares problem as a mathematical problem. So we're trying to find an X that makes it so the AX as close as possible to B. This is a little digression he goes into about, hey, many problems that don't look linear, you can turn them into linear problems with transformation of variables. This is uh, something I'm sure we all know, but just to, just to uh, emphasize it here. Uh, for example, if you have an exponential function like this, you can take logarithm and turn it into a linear function. Or if you have a power law, you can do a log log transformation and then turn it into a linear function like this. There's an interesting exercise he has for this that I thought I would repeat here. Uh, exercise 3.17 uh, talks about Kepler. He found that the orbital period of the planets depends on the distance from the sun, the mean distance from the sun, according to some power law, tau equals c times r to the alpha. And he found that alpha was actually a simple rational number. And in this physics, there's reasons, well, the physics and why it should be a simple rational number, but let's look at some data. So we can perform a linear, he asks us in this problem to perform a linear least squares fit uh, from the table. So he gives us a table of orbital periods in days and distance from, or mean anomalies, mean mean distance from the sun in mega kilometers, I think with the units, which is a strange unit. But in any event, we can just plot that, see what it looks like, it looks like this. Um, we can, because it's a power law, we can do a log log transformation and turn to a linear problem. It's gonna fit Y is now log tau, um, X is now uh, log R, and I was in, sorry, not X, but uh, sorry, uh, we're the, yeah, X is log R, and so we can put that into our little tall matrix here, just you know, using this point operator, which you gotta get used to. It looks like almost any function you can, if you use a little the, a dot here after it'll, it'll do a uh, point wise, element wise, which is kind of interesting. And we can use our backslash operator to solve that. And the only coefficient I care about is the second coefficient, which is this alpha right here. And there we see it's 1.49864 uh, in the fit. It's very close to three halves, which does match Kepler's third law, which is usually expressed like this, tau squared is proportional to r cubed. Uh, just for fun, we can plot that and see that it does fit. Um, well, I actually use the real not the real, but actually use the coefficient, the fit coefficient, it works really well. Um, it'd be interesting to put in three halves, but I think that it's just so very, very close. I don't think you'd see any difference in the line. Okay, so that's that exercise just to show that we know how to do transformations. Now, the next thing is, let's go ahead and see what's going on with that backslash operator. What is it doing? Um, so the first step to doing that is to look at the normal equations, and that's what this section is about. Just spoiler alert, it turns out that the backslash doesn't use the normal equations, but this is how we get started on it anyway. Um, so one way of doing it, though, does depend on this theorem. If, if x satisfies um, this equation, a transpose multiplied by ax minus b equals zero, then it does solve the linear least squares problem. That is, the x minimizes um, this quantity. And the proof is in, in, the, in the text. It basically just involves taking AX minus B and perturbing the X a little bit and expanding it all out. And then, uh, and then take, I'm sorry, doing calculating the two norm on it, expanding it out, and then seeing that if this quantity is zero, then it does, it does, uh, it does minimize the, the, the least squares problem. But if you multiply all that out, you find the, um, uh, the normal equation. So this now looks, by multiplying by A transpose, our equation to uh, looks to satisfy this one right here looks like this, which now looks like an ordinary problem we've already solved, right? It's a square matrix, turns out to be symmetric, uh, times x equals some uh, vector. So x's are unknown here. We can now solve this using the techniques we've learned previously if we wanted to. And in fact, because this now is a square matrix, we can contemplate anyway, taking the inverse. We shouldn't, as you know, but we can contemplate taking the inverse and that leads us to this idea of the pseudo inverse, which is indicated by a plus sign like this. And the, the idea is that um, this acts like, when multiplied by the left, acts like an inverse, and then it solves that equation. 
Uh, for the same reason, we don't use the actual matrix inverse for solving the square matrix. We don't use this for solving this problem either. But conceptually, the backslash operator is able to use the pseudo inverse for whenever it runs into a rectangular matrix, which is cool. It uses the rec and that's sorry, not uses, but computes the pseudo inverse, <laughs> not by directly computing it though. Uh, let's see, the matrix A transpose A that appears in this normal equation or in the pseudo inverse has some important properties. Uh, one is it's clearly symmetric. Um, that's an exercise they ask you to do, but it's just obvious if you take the transpose of A transpose A, you get A transpose A again. So it's clearly symmetric. Uh, it's singular um, only if the columns of A are linearly dependent, which is an interesting property, which is probably what we want because it's A that we care about, not A transpose A. And finally, we if uh, A, this is also very important from what Andrew just covered, it turns out if A transpose A is non-singular, then it's also positive definite, which is, and so it's a symmetric positive definite matrix in cases when we can come with solution at all. So that's good. We can potentially use that uh, decomposition that we learned about the Cholsky decomposition. And that's in fact what they show. They say, okay, this gives us a way to solve this. We can just use our previous methods, but take advantage of the fact that the matrix is symmetric and positive definite. We can write it as R transpose R, and then we can just use this forward sub backward sub and solve our least squared normal equation that way, which I thought was pretty cool. He says this algorithm uh, is asymptotic to this expression here for what it's worth. Basically order n cubed, or I guess you might say the order. Yeah, it's this. I was gonna try to see if there's something you can just say it's order of something, but. Maybe it's not. asymptotic to asymptotic. No, two. no, this is asymptotic to this, but I'm saying it's a big O. Right. Well, how would you rate this in big O? You the problem with the M and N, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, the, both of them play a, a role. So yeah. I, I, I guess it's it's going to be O, that whole thing. <laughs> yeah. I guess it depends. Like if you're worried about, if you have like a fixed number of um, columns in your matrix, but you could have more observations, then that would be, you know, um, M getting bigger than you don't you oh it's only order M which is nice because that means if I have more observations it's not get that much harder to solve but if I have more columns right more variables then that gets then it, then it scales very poorly <laughs> yeah that's right okay so the next section okay we're a little great on time talks about conditioning and stability following on from what happened in the last chapter um, he says first of all he says that the algorithm Julia does not use the normal equations because of instability. The instability is caused by uh, the way the condition number works when you're dealing with the normal uh, equations. First of all, he defines the uh, condition number for a rectangular matrix to be very similar to how we define it for a regular uh, square matrix, it's just using the pseudo inverse instead, okay? Um, so he says when the residuals are small, the conditioning of the least squared problem is order of K, kappa, right? But our algorithm that we just did uses A transpose A, so the condition number gets amplified. It's going to be order K squared, or A, uh, cap of A squared, right? Which is can destabilize the normal equation. That's the idea, that it's, uh, it's going to be sensitive to small changes. And whatever sensitivity you had originally is now going to get squared or doubled in log space, I suppose. So this is kind of an interesting thing because I went through this demo that you did here and I found kind of the same issue you had and I don't get the same results. And I don't know whether that uh, you guys tried this demo yet or not, but he sets up this uh, matrix um, A with using these functions, um, sine squared and then cosine squared, but with a very, very small phase shift on it, right? That's what is what's gonna make it uh, unstable. Um, and the conditioning number of this matrix is 1.8. So he sets up some fake problem. This is where we're gonna know the coefficients. We're setting the coefficients or X to one, two and one. And just going to set B equal to A times X. So this should have very, very, well, theoretically zero residual when we try to fit it. This is like one of those singular cases, right? Or singular is not the right, case, right word, but, um, well, you know what I mean? It's one of those uh, measure zero cases where it exactly fits. So we can yeah. use the back, go ahead, Andrew, you got a better way to put it, I think. Yeah. No? Okay. Maybe yeah, right. you're right. It's sort of like one of those measure, yeah. it's the same. Measure zero. Yeah. So we can use the backslash operator and it turns out that the absorbed error is small. Um, and there's like 11 digits of accuracy. So it's of order of the um, 
condition number, right? So uh, condition number times, I'm sorry, times the machine epsilon, right? Which is what we kind of expect. Um, so what, what we see, the absorbed error, absorbed error is this, I guess I didn't print out K times epsilon, but. It, it's in your error bound at the next Oh, there line. it is. So yeah, so it's of the, you know, it's not terribly different than that. It, the error bound is, it's actually less than the error bound. So it's actually doing really well, right? So this is about as good as we can expect. Um, for that case. So now the next thing is, okay, let's try using normal equations. So we define, you know, it just writes it out. So um, uh, N is A transpose A, uh, X N from the normal equations is gonna be N backslash A transpose B. This is just using the normal equations, just brute force, just take, you know, use it as it is and calculate the observed error. Uh, and then, oh, wait a minute, two times E to the minus 16. Well, the book had like a much bigger number. So I don't know what happened to the backslash number now somehow recognizes it's use a different algorithm or something to solve this. When it sees this, it's what, it wasn't as bad a condition as the, well, not even close. The book said, let's see what they get. Hold on, man. I'm down the right section here. They got two accurate digits as opposed to 15 as we get here. So that's a very different answer. I have no idea what's going on there. So yeah, just, I also got 15, but my other numbers were are different from the, yours. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, this is the same as what I also showed so earlier. I, I have no idea. Hmm. But for fun, I say, okay, let's try the this LS normal thing that we defined ourselves, right? Where we're actually gonna use the back sub forward sub thing. In that case, I do find, you know, that um, only two digits of accuracy. So there, that instability does come through if we do the back sub forward sub thing on the normal equations that we define ourselves in uh, above. So anyway, I thought that was interesting that whatever the back slash operator is between when he wrote this chapter and then they must've made some changes to it, I assume. Unless there's something else I didn't see any. Now that you guys are at least torn, you've seen the same thing. I, I assume that they've made some kind of improvement to the uh, back slash operator to understand that's in this kind of situation and fix it. <laughs> What is doing? I do not know. Okay, so this uh, last exercise is not a Julie exercise, just a math exercise, but I, I did go through it, so I thought I'd put it in here in case you guys are interested. It was just the idea that if A is an invertible matri matrix, then show that the pseudo inverse is actually just the inverse. And to do that, you first just have to observe that if A is invertible, then so is this transpose, which is pretty easy to show. You just write down A transpose equals I. You take the transpose of it, you can see at least the left inverse is well-defined. And if you do it the other way around, A inverse A, you can find out the right transpose is the same thing, so it's invertible. And then it's just a matter of taking, uh, writing down the pseudo inverse and then factoring in the inverse operator using the rule that the inverse of a product is the inverse is, uh, how do you say it? I, I wrote it out, that's good because it's really hard for me to see out of my head. The inverse of a product of two matrices is the product of the inverses, but in the reverse order. And you just put that in there. And these, you know, now we use the fact that the A transpose inverse exists. So we can not to worry about that. And then we can cancel those two out. And then we just end up with A inverse. So that shows that the pseudo inverse is just the inverse in the case of uh, an invertible matrix. So that's as far as I got, which is good because that's about all the time we have. Uh, I don't know. Any questions, observations, complaints? <laughs> no. I was annoyed by their notation <laughs> oh. of M and N and X it, it, like coming from statistics. Like yeah, everything me too. You was... saw that I struggled <laughs> with that a little bit. <laughs> and when I was looking at that equation, like, well, that's not actually X because X is the coefficient. So yeah. <laughs> I yeah. struggled with that too. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, we're all familiar yeah, with thought... this. Thing, but it's just an interesting to look at it from this kind of more theoretical way, right? Yeah, and from the, like the condition number, because I can't think of a single time where, like, we had to, you know, find the normal equations, but I can't think of a single time where somebody was like, well, um, make sure you use, like, a good algorithm for it. Well, that's why this is a, just like... course, a book on numerical <laughs> computation, right? <laughs> It's yeah. like what's going on behind the scenes, all these clever things we use, like an R um, that, you know, 
it's one of the reasons why ours makes yeah, it, I don't ours such a great know. thing is that they've done all that work, right? But do they? So does the LM function I not just do like solve like matrix inverse? I, I don't I know. No, it does not. No. It probably does QR factorization. Yeah, I think it does. I think I did remember. Mm. And that's what we're going to talk oh, about yeah. next. Next, next two chap, next two sections things about QR factorization, how to do this whole thing better without using the normal equation. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I guess you can specify the default. Yeah, is QR for the LM function. We, so when 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 I studied this sort of like least squares kind of stuff, uh, the there was a big emphasis on multicollinearity at that time. Or at least there was around that time, so it was like uh, the condition number did show up, uh, but it's more mm -hmm. of like okay, it's you, the the main thing, or at least the main takeaway from there was that you should avoid or you should choose your variables a bit more carefully, right? And then you mm -hmm. also have to uh, think of the parameterization a bit more carefully, like what parameters you want to identify maybe you're not interested in the separate effects of two variables that are highly correlated but rather the the sum or the difference or whatever so it's some, still important mm -hmm. i mean in the yeah. book introduction to statistical learning that's a book club on here too they they spent some time on that yeah, yeah. that's yeah, a good if, book by the i way, think i've only discussed multicollinearity in terms of like statistical performance and not computation like accuracy i guess <laughs> yeah yeah you know it's like you get inflated variances and signs changing and those sorts of things yeah but it makes sense to pair the pair the information together Well, cool. mm. all right. Um.